Good morning. Good morning. Oh, y'all ready, aren't you? It's a big day for us today. I'm telling you, Fall Festival is here. Well, I hope you're having fun. My story fell down. We'll leave it down for right now. We won't mess with that. I'll come back. How about that? I don't know what you do for fun. I thought I'd tell you that since it's like flannel, whatever, plaid day kind of thing. Uh, I don't know what you do for fun, but here's what I do. I want you to look at this picture. Here's what I do. I go out in the woods and I cut wood for fun. Anybody do that for fun? Okay, we got one. You want one? one? Okay. And then I take this wood and I put it in there. This is a wood shed. I add it onto it. I like to build things and cut wood. I like to go out in the woods, sit down on the stump, and turn on Barry Manilow and just sit there. Is that a problem here, people? <laughs> How many listen to Barry Manilow? Why don't you lie to me? And we talked about this. Go ahead and lie to you. Let me listen, listen to Barry Manilow. Raise your hand. Just everybody raise your hand. Look at there. Now that feels much better to me, you know, listening to Barry Manilow. But anyway, I, I like going out in the woods doing that kind of stuff and just enjoying stuff, having some fun out there, watching the deer run. Hope you have deer at your house. They eat everything at my house. Every plant I put out, they eat. They think I'm feeding them, um, and, I, and I'm not doing that. Well, we're talking about the story. Things are getting interesting here with the story. Now, this over here, this is the Laura story. So I'm going to try this one more time. You know what causes that? The base causes that. Boom. That's what happens. This is the Laura story. This is the upper story. For everybody that's new, we've got a lot of new people. What we've been doing is we've actually gone through the Bible in a year. It's actually less than a year. We only have three more, counting the day. And so in two weeks, we're all going to heaven. So you want to come on that one. That's a good day to come. It's two weeks from now. We're all leaving and going to heaven. And so, so we've been walking through this story and how God, you know, taking care of things. Um, the reason why we're, ever, we're, we're doing the Bible and actually reading out of the Bible and hearing the story is because God loves us. And that's not a T-shirt. That's really why this happened. So when you read the Bible, it's really about you. It's about us. The whole thing was about that. So God's up here, and he wanted to do something that hadn't been done. He needed a creation that could make a choice. That hasn't happened before. We're not angels, except for me, of course, but, and your children are angels, I know. But he, create, he wanted to create something, a creation, which was you, by the way, that could have a choice because you have to choose to love. You just, you know, you love's not a feeling and love's not, you know, a warm fuzzy here or there. Everything works right. Gonna be, love's a choice. And so that's what he wanted. And so he decided to create this thing in the garden so he could give us a choice. And so Adam and Eve were in the garden and they decided to choose and they chose the trees. They chose over God, and this caused this problem we call sin. That's kind of where you are. That's where I am. We're all sinners. Is everybody okay with that? If you're a sinner, raise your hand. Okay, I feel much better. But this is what happened over here, okay? So we're in this garden thing, and sin's been created. So God has a plan way up here, way up here, 70,000 feet. He's going to make a way. He's going to make a way in the Lord's story. The Lord's story is called the Bible. This is how it all worked out. So this is what we've been talking about. He brings Jesus, baby Jesus born, we have Christmas, we put up a tree, we do all that stuff, and then he's born for one thing, he's crucified, and he dies, he's put in the grave, three days later he comes back, and now we have this thing, we have choice. Now you can choose to accept Jesus Christ and get back to the Creator. This is the whole plan to begin with. How do I get you back to me? But I want you to choose me this time. I want you to want to love me. I want you to choose. It's not always going to be pretty. It's not always going to be fun. And, you know, it's not going to always be warm and fuzzy. But I need you to choose me. And that's what he's been looking for all along. So we, we have these stories that are unfolding, and everything is shifting. One of the things that happened in the stories that you need to pay attention to is that God basically did everything for us here. He did everything for us over here. And he did everything around us. He made things happen in the Old Testament. He made things, you know, do this and go there. And he made sure Jesus was born in Bethlehem. He did all this stuff. And everything is changing right now. The story is changing. It is moving. All three stories are about to come together into one story. And it's going to be called the My Story. And we're in you know, my church. And so you have to think about this. We were part of the, you know, in the beginning, it was all for us and all about us. 
And now we're going to move into the story. And for the first time, God is actually going to work through us and not around us. This is new. This is new. Jesus called it the my church. He said, I'm going to build my church and hell will not withstand it. And when I say church, he's talking about you. He's not talking about the building. He's not talking about the grounds or whatever you think church is. He's talking about you. You are the church he's going to build. So the my church is what he's been after all along. So when I say my church loves you, that's what Jesus will be telling us. My church actually loves you. My church actually cares for you. When it rains, we'll cover you. You see, that's what my church does. When you're in trouble, you can, you can lean on me. That's what my church does. And now here's the, here's the thought for you. It, you know, I, I, I hear this and I see this. There's church, it was church out there that says, I love my church. We got all that. And you need to love your church. I hope you love Marathon. I hope you love your church. But I need you to be in love, listen to this, with the cause of the church and not just the church. Okay, because the cause of the church, what Jesus has been doing all along is moving the kingdom and its people that he's looking for. And the only way the kingdom moves now and the way it's going to move is going to be because of you. We're going to be the my church. So when I say my church loves you, there's something behind that. Something's going to happen. If I tell my wife I love you and I don't do anything, that's not love. There's got to be some action behind that. I, can't, I know y'all told your wife that you loved her when you got married, but you need to tell her more than that. It needs to happen more often. And so you have to think for a moment. When I say my church loves you, that's how Jesus was thinking, that you're going to be the hands, you're going to be the feet, and everything is going to work through you. It's not going to be just in the building. It's going to be inside you. We're going to move it from the building, move it to the hearts of men, so that wherever you go, you will take the church with you, and you will be the church. And so that's something you have to think about that's just happened in the book of Acts. Everything has just shifted. He moved it from him doing everything to you. So if the kingdom moves, you move it. If people are saved, you doing it. You know, watch this. Why do you serve? You ever thought about this? This, this, this? You have to think for a moment. Many people serve because they think they're helping the church out. Well, that's beautiful. Now, I appreciate that. But you really you are serving because that's the only way the kingdom moves. It's going to move because of you. Tonight, we're going to move the kingdom, okay? This afternoon, tonight, there's going to be 7,000 people on this campus, and we're going, to, we're going to reach out to them. One thing you've got to be careful of is that you don't put the task over the people. You, know, you ask yourself, why am I working where I'm working? Well, that's the easy thing. It's because of people. Everywhere you go, you are the church, and you move the kingdom because that's how it works. He empowered us through the Holy Spirit. We talked about that last week, how it came into the room, you know, and it came into those, those tongues were everywhere, and they came into those disciples, and they went out, and 3,000 people were added to the number daily, and uh, people were selling things and moving the kingdom. Everything was happening, not because of individual Christians, but because of a community of believers. My fear is, because of the church culture we live in, is that we see ourselves as an individual Christian and not a community of believers moving the cause. Tonight, what well, well, would you listen? There's almost 300 volunteers, almost 300, the most I have ever seen at a fall festival. They're going to all work one thing. Now, somebody's going to be doing games. Somebody's going to be on hay rides. Somebody's going to be doing parking. And there won't be enough room. I got it. And the lines are going to be too long. You know, all that's going to happen. But we're moving to get, moving the kingdom together. And what happens, here's what you need to know. What happens next week, those people who've never found Marathon, didn't know a church was here, and never knew that anybody cared about them, they come back. And that's when we show them what Jesus Christ can do for them. That's what we do. That's how we move the kingdom. So you have to think, this power is going to be coming through us. It's not an individual thing. It's a collection of you know, believers moving the kingdom, moving the cause. This is why it was set up the whole time. So you have to think, where do I fit into that? Now, you, again, you can choose. My fear is that you won't choose. You'll choose to sit it out. Now, let me say this. Half of this New Testament thing we're moving into, most of it is don't give up, don't quit, stay the course, finish the race. Because ministry and people are very messy. 
This is why most of you would rather just take care of your personal Christianity and come to church and do your thing. People are going to be messy, and we're here for people. I wrote a blog. It's going to come out next week. It's called Leave the Knife In, Don't Bleed Out. Sounds pretty rough, don't it? Uh, that's ministry. You're going to work hard. You're going to put your energy and your time into people, and they're going to leave. And they're going to go back their old ways, and they're going to do things that you don't want them to do. And you're going to say, and here's the thought that's going to come in. I want to quit. I want to stop. Now, how does that work? If we're the only ones moving the kingdom, what just happened? The kingdom quits moving. We all are part of this thing. We all have our thing to do. We all see people nobody else will see. We all have to move the kingdom. But every, listen, I'm telling you, it's going to be hard and it's going to be messy. And so Paul writes all these things in the New Testament. Don't quit. Don't give up. Hang in there. Stay the course. Finish the race. We'll talk more next week about that. But he's doing that kind of thing. Because this is hard stuff. Somebody bled for us. You're going to have to bleed for them. I know you just want to come comfort, peace, and joy. That's what we want. Christianity isn't about your comfort. It's just so hard. Christianity was never about your comfort. It was always about the cause. It was always about the my church. And if we step out of it, who will move it? You know what happened in the Old Testament when they stepped out? He waited. He waited to the next generation and the next person. You know why God can do that? Because he doesn't live in time. He lives in eternity. You know, so he could step out and he could wait until the next generation wants to, listen, I'm going to be that generation. And we have been. Let, let, me, let me tell you this real quick. They did a survey. And I'm going to say this, and, you know, I'm not saying it, but I am saying it. Does that make sense? Don't hear what I'm not saying. How about that? All right. They did a survey that said, they said, they, here's the question. Do you believe that America is going to hell in a handbasket? Okay, so I said it. It's out there now. All right. Do you believe? 58% of Americans believe that, that America is going to hell in a handbasket. So well, let me ask you this. Why don't, we, why, don't we just, why don't we just end it? Every generation is thinking the same thing. We're over here, we want, to, we want to tell God in the upper story, why don't you just end it? This is so bad. Not bad yet. I, I used to hear these, I go to revival, you probably remember revivals? I go to revival meetings and they would like, come on, take us home right now. They'd all be down the altar crying, screaming, take me home. Get me out of this mess. You know, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. Get me out of here. Why do you think you're still here? Why don't, why don't he just do that? You know, do, you under, do you understand the, what's happening here? What, was the per, what is the point? See, God's going to wait to the last soul before he comes back. Because he wants as many people as possibly can accept Jesus Christ and, and have a relationship with God. That's why he did this to begin with, all of this. It wasn't comfort, peace, and joy all the time. You want comfort. And you want joy, but in between is pain. This is the hardest part, is the pain. As soon as you have pain, you know what you do? You run. You run. Some of you, some of you have run from another church because they were painful or whatever. You're not going to like everything here. It's going to be painful. God's trying to grow us up. We've got to be able to work through pain and still move kingdom. We've got to still be able to bleed, lead the knife in, but don't bleed out and keep moving kingdom. Listen, I'd have quit years ago because of pain. Goodness gracious. I didn't know people did. I couldn't imagine people not liking me. You ever had that thought? I can't believe you don't like me. What do you mean you write something like that? You know, when you put that blog out there on me, what do I do? I'm just trying to move the kingdom. You ever had that thought? And so you look at this and you think, am I in it for my comfort and peace and joy and everybody approve what I'm doing or am I in it to move the kingdom? That's a different thought. And so the apostle Paul you know, you had to think for a moment, what was he in this for? Now, let me help you real quick because you're going to need to know this because many people don't think about this when it comes to Paul. He's actually, his name was Saul in the beginning. His name was Saul. So let me help you real quick because you're going to read through this and you're going to think, oh, Paul's, there had to be a point guy in the gospel. 
Okay, somebody had to run point on this thing. This is a new thing. God's creating a thing called the church, which is you. He's empowering you to do things. He's going to create things in you. You can do all things through Christ. That's not a t-shirt. That's a true statement. And he's going to do that. But they had to be a point guy. We would have never, listen, this is just like God. He never picks who you think he's going to pick. And he always does the impossible with the most unlikely. So look, I'm going to take you back into this time where the church was and what was going on. I know you recognize the name Osama bin Laden. I know you recognize that. The Apostle Paul, who was Saul at this time, was equivalent to Osama bin Laden in his day. Here's what you have to understand. The Christians were the infidels. You are a threat to the government and the religious status of that day. So you are going to be taken out. And we're going to commission Saul to do it. So Saul is going to go from town to town, dragging people out of their houses and murdering them because you are an infidel. And listen, Paul was very, which is Saul, is very good at it. He had the backing of the government, had the backing of the religious crowd. So I'm going from town to town, Piedmont to Powdersville. I'm going around and I am taking care of you. It is kind of a little strange that this came up where we are right now with ISIS and what's going on. Anybody not like them, they will die. This is Paul. This is the guy that you're dealing with. So here we are. God's going to pick him. Do you understand what's going on here? God's going to pick this guy to be the point guy. He's going to stop him on the road. And we'll talk more about this. He's going to speak to him. He said, why are you persecuting me? He blinds him. He can't see. And God's going to pick this guy to start 10 churches and write over half the New Testament. This is that guy. You depict him? No way. Now, let's just think about the, the Christians for a moment. The new Christians, the infidels who are hiding because they're afraid that somebody's going to kill them, and they're all after them. And here we are with Paul, who's coming into town, and now he has changed his way of living, and he has changed his thoughts. Let me ask you a question. You're going to invite him into your house? They're all worried that just some kind of secret thing that's going on. Why did God pick Paul? You ever thought about it? As passionate as he was at killing people, he will also be equally as passionate at saving people. And God knew it. Everything changed. But God picked people. He handpicked him. Handpicked him. Nobody would ever pick him. And even Paul, I'm going to read something new. Even Paul was confused. He said, I can't believe he chose me. Now, you'd have to have a voice from God to speak to somebody like Paul. And it came down. In 1 Corinthians 15, 9, I want you to hear what Paul said. He's talking to people, the Christians around him. It was fitting that I bring up the rear. You know, he said, I'm the chief among sitters. You remember this? I'm the chief. I'm the worst. Well, let me say this before I read the rest of it. There is no excuse in this room. You're going to tell me how bad you've been and where you've been and what you did and God can't use you. There is no excuse. If God can pick Osama bin Laden to move the kingdom, he can use us. And some of you listen real carefully what I'm about to tell you. Some of you are thinking I'm going to, you're going to quit. Well, that's just beautiful. Well, let's all quit. You may tell you what, if somebody had quit, Marathon wouldn't have been born. You wouldn't be in this place, and the kingdom wouldn't be moving. Somebody bled for you. You're going to have to bleed. You're going to have to know that going in. It's going to hurt, but you can't quit. Paul says, I'm the one bringing up the rear. I'm the one, you know, I'm the chief among sinners. And he kept going. He said, I don't deserve to be included in the inner circle. He was talking to the disciples. I, I don't deserve to be where you are. I was dragging you out of the house, your people, and murdering them. I do not deserve this. That's what he said. 
as you well know, I spent all those years trying my best to stamp God's church out completely. He says, even Paul is confused. How can you use me? And that's what he says, I'm a dead man walking. Just like in that song, I'm a dead man walking. It's not I who lives, but it's Christ lives in me. You know, can you hear that, that tone from him? Somebody who was stamping out God's church and now is moving God's church, now has met God, salvation has happened, and he has, he has knowledge and inspiration he never had before because of the Holy Spirit. Everything changed. He cannot believe it. He cannot believe it. And let me tell you this, Paul's going to pay a heavy price for moving the kingdom. It's going to be rough. He's going to want to die many times. Many times he's going to ask God, can I come home now? And he gets to see heaven. Now, that would have made me mad. Would it not make you mad? I get to see heaven and I have to come back down here and spend time with you. This is how he was thinking. I got to stay with them. I got to stay with those people. He says, it's actually better if I do for now. He said, but I know what's waiting on me. I know what's coming. That's what you got to get. This is the only time we have. This is it. We have to move the kingdom now. There is no waiting. There is no excuse. And sure, you're going to hurt and you're going to bleed. Absolutely. Jesus thought we were worth bleeding for. This whole thing's about moving the kingdom. The whole thing. In Romans 12, 1 through 2, I'm going to give you some instructions how you must think because we leak all the time. I'm just going to give that thought. We leak. All right? Here's what it says. It'll be on the screen. So here's what I want you to do. I'm using the message translation so that it'll be easier to understand. Whatever translation you want, just do something. Okay? Here's what he said. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life. Watch this. You're sleeping, you're eating, going to work, and walking around uh, life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you and the best thing you can do for Him. In other words, I need you, is everybody looking at me? Excuse me. Look at me. I need you to pay attention is what he's saying to what God's doing. You have to see people over tasks. You can't see work, you see people. You, see, you, you, you don't see pain as God's mad. You have to see pain as God's moving. People never change without pain. Do y'all know that? You will keep doing the same thing over and over and over until something hurts. And then you'll quit doing that. And then you'll move something else. If the chair you're in now is hurting you, you won't sit there next week. Does everybody understand that? So pain is a good thing. It's part of life. And you have to realize that. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit in, in it without even thinking. Does that sound like us? We just kind of like, you know, float right into that thing. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. That's what he does. Ready, readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Quickly respond. Pay attention. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down at its level of immaturity. So this is a maturity thought. God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. Pain brings maturity. You don't like it, you want to run. We leak stuff. Here, here's what you need to know. It's not natural for you to love other people. It's not natural for you to care about other people. It's not natural to give your life away or natural to give your money away. Your, your thought is to keep it and hold on to it. That's our natural thought. And so when God comes in and starts transforming our life, there's some things that he produces in us that it makes us different from everything else. That's why he said you can't just blindly walk into the culture. You're not like them. You're like someone else. You're like Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit is going to produce these things. But the problem we have is that we leak. We leak. And a lot of the things that you hear, you're going to hear me say, you're going to think that this is for you. Understand the My Church concept. It's not just for you. It's to move the kingdom. But you're going to be the one to do it. So we leak, we leak a lot. And I'm going to read something to you because I think that you need to know this. We talk about 
what God produces in us. And you'll hear this as the fruit of the Spirit. I want you to hear. Here's what he says. We're going to produce love. Now, when you first accept Jesus Christ, you really have all this because you're filled up and you haven't leaked yet. So here's what you got. You're going to produce love. We're going to produce joy. We're going to have peace. We're going to have patience. Don't you love this? Uh, we're going to be kind. We're going to be good. <laughs> Don't you love this? Uh, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Many of you lose self-control in your car, don't you? And when you wave at people when they go by and you say, I love you. Thank you for pulling out in front of me. I just love you. I just want to pray for you right now. What's your tag number? Let me pray for you. So we look, and uh, he said, and all these things are produced. And here's what happened like <laughs> Sunday morning, right now. All right, we are, we all, we're all cool. We're filling up. We're good. God loves us. We're going to help, you know. But Monday don't feel the same, you see. And the reason it don't, because we don't, we don't get with God. It's a refilling every day. This is what he's saying. you got to pay attention. you got to set everything before him. I'm going to work today. Fill me up. Help me pay attention to people over task. And that's what happens. Sorry about that. This is under nose running off. I don't know. But you have to realize that this is more about people than it is task. Even today as we do what we're going to do, many of you are going to be serving. And you'll get caught up in making sure the game's working more than you are the people in the line. you got to be careful. And Paul talked about that. This is a refilling every day. There's no way you can deal with people without the Holy Spirit in your life, right? Amen. Because you will want to hurt them. Amen. Yes. You will lose control. You will not be kind. You will not love. You will not be gentle. This is, listen, and you were asking God, God, give me patience. Listen, it's not for you. You know why all these things were given? It's because of people. God, if you don't help me with self-control, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wave at people I shouldn't wave at. If you don't help me love, I'm not going to love. You can't do this on your own. It never was meant to be. We have to think like Paul. We have to move the kingdom, and we can never quit, and we can never give up. As many times as we want to, the Bible tells us to finish and finish well. Now, here's what I want to say to you. I've never seen so many volunteers for a fall festival that I can remember. I've never seen that many. Y'all go ahead, yeah. I hope you're one of them. We're going to find out, and we're going to pray for all y'all in a minute. But today we're going to move the kingdom. That's what's going to happen. It's going to move today. There's going to be thousands of people. We've got to love on them. They're going to find Marathon, and they're going to think for a moment. Somebody actually cares here. And then next weekend, they're going to come back, and we're going to show them how much we really care. That's what's going to happen. It happens every, every year, every weekend. This is why we do Fall Festival. We can never quit. We can never stop. We can never give up. Ever. Because we're the only ones that moves the kingdom. Now, here's what I want you to do. If you're a volunteer at Marathon for any reason whatsoever, I want you to stand with me. If you volunteer at Marathon, stand up with me. Roy, come on down. Thank you all guys for volunteering. I'm going to have a word of prayer for you guys. I want to tell you, without you guys, it doesn't happen. Whatever role you play, whatever you think it's small, big, or whatever, nothing happens unless you move it. This is not just moving, helping the church out. This is moving people to the cross. That's why we do this. That's what you have to remember. Now, here's what I'm going to, I'm going to pray for you, and here's what I want to tell everybody else. We have more spots that we need today filled. We need some more in the parking area and a couple more in the games area. If you want to help, they'll be down front in just a minute, okay? But I want to pray for you. I want to, y'all ready to move the kingdom tonight? It's coming. Here we go. Let's pray. Father, thank you for what you're doing. I pray your Holy Spirit will continue to work at Marathon and help us to move the kingdom for you. I pray we'll always pay attention to people. I pray, Father, that we'll do what you do. I pray we'll be like Paul and never quit until the day you call us home. Thank you for these wonderful volunteers that are making this happen. I pray your Holy Spirit will fill each one today. I pray it will be smooth. I know there's thousands coming today. I pray for parking. Everything is going to happen from games. I pray we don't lose any kids, all that stuff. 
everything from hayride to whatever. And Father, thank you for what's about to be. And we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.